singer, comedian and actor Mike Doyle has been entertaining since he was a teenager. Today, he divides his time between land and sea, spending 10 months a year as a headline act on cruise ships. He's traveled the world many times, but his heart belongs to Wales. I was born in Carmarthen, in West Wales. West is best, God's country. And uh, mum and dad still live there today. And um, brought up there with my brother Phil in Carmarthen. A great place uh, to, to grow up. Mike has fond memories of his Catholic school days that helped nurture and develop his passion for music, drama and geography. A trilogy which still shapes his life today. And one of the brothers uh, had, a, had a folk group over at the youth club. And one day I remember going over there, it was snowing. It was the 23rd of December. And I peeped into the window of, of the youth club and I, and I got all the, the ice away, you know. Wee, 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 wee. And there was a semicircle of people playing guitars. I was absolutely gobsmacked. I thought, wow, look at this, look at this. I've seen people play guitar on television. I watched Top of the Pops and all the rest of it, but I've never actually seen anybody physically play a guitar. And I, well, I was freezing cold and looking through this tiny little window at this semicircle, singing, Kumbaya, my lord, Kumbaya. I thought, this is great. This is like brilliant. Mike was 11 or 12 years old at the time, and Christmas was just two days away. He'd already asked for a chopper bike, but he just knew he had to have a guitar. Dad, in all fairness, uh, went out, and I thought, oh gosh, my mum said, you know, you shouldn't have said that, you know. Dad works very hard, and you're having a bike, and uh, so um, Christmas morning came, and when I w woke up in the morning, there was the rally chopper bike, and a sharp tape recorder where you press record and play together, and a little microphone, and I used to put it against the television to record Top of the Pops. And um, this was probably 1972, something like that. And um, my brother had an Evil Knievel set. And then we gave our presents to mum and dad that we'd stolen from Woolworths. <laughs> and uh, joke, that was. And, uh, and then dad said, oh, look, you know, there's another one there. What's that then? And they opened the box and there it was. An Antoria classic guitar. A beautiful classical Spanish guitar. I didn't know how to play it and Dad said to me, you know, well, let's hear a tune then, you know. <laughs> and uh, I never get my brother, he looked by my mother's penny and said, any chance of me having a bike then? <laughs> so uh, he had the bike and um, there I was with my sharp tape recorder, my little microphone and my guitar in the box room. And I close that door and imagine that I'm playing to thousands of people somewhere. I adored this guitar like you'll never believe. And every day I'd learn a chord or whatever. And that's how really it all began for me, was that little dream, you know? But it wasn't just a dream. Mike and his friends started jamming together and formed a group called Tattoo. We used to practice in my mate's house, which was a terraced house around the corner from where I lived. And I always remember Ina, which was Andy's mother, you know, having rows next door with the neighbours, going, well, they've got to practice somewhere, you know, so fair play to her. That band became a speed limit, and then speed limit, and then we became casual affair. And funny, I think casual affair is still going today, actually. And um, that was a great band. We had dicky bows like this big and frilly shirts and, and white trousers and blue velvet jackets and white shoes, you know. And then we changed from trying to be a rock band, like we thought we were, to playing, we, we, we were then a cabaret band, and we went all over the UK. We decided to play social clubs and instead of pubs and village halls, you know. So we're now playing working men's clubs, when the working men's clubs were massive. All throughout Wales, all throughout the Midlands, the North East. Clubs just like the Raffa Club in Carmarthen. This is where Mike used to come with his parents, Tommy and Kay, to sing as a teenager. And when he turned 18, the club paid him in beer tokens. I honestly used to think this was massive. The organ, which is over there now, we'll have a look at that in a minute, but it used to be over here. Gwen used to play for me. And um, I always remember they used to say things like, Hey, yeah, can follow anybody, that boy mine. Follow anybody. You start, now we'll follow. Just start singing, you'll follow any key. 
Oh, it's be fantastic. So you just stand here, you know, when the twilight is gone, he'd be here. <laughs> it's great. A great place to start. A brilliant place to start. It really, really was. But although the singing and performing was going well, school wasn't such a success for Mike, who has dyslexia. He left without passing any exams. I'm ashamed of that, really. Could have tried a lot harder uh, academically. But um, I, I, all I could think about was the chords to Shergat at the time, you know? And his teachers were not impressed. I left school, you see, and uh, no exams, and being told by, uh, if you don't mind, I won't mention the name, but being told that I will amount to nothing because I had no, I had no exams, no nothing. He said, you and your pipe dreams and playing the guitar and all that, he says. I said, you'll amount to nothing. Say it. Say it, boy. And I stood up and he said, and he said say it. You will amount to nothing. And I went, you will amount to nothing, sir. <laughs> That's what I said. Oh, everybody laughed. There we are. But, yeah, I'd like to think that something did come of it. With the teacher's harsh words ringing in his ears, Mike turned to his family. I went home and told my dad what a certain teacher had said to me. And he said, well, we'll, we'll soon see about that. And I'm just so lucky and so blessed that my father, a great name in um, mechanical and engineering, just made one phone call, you see. So no exams, no nothing. Leave school Friday, Monday interview, Tuesday working. Mike spent four years as an apprentice paint sprayer. He loved the job, but it proved to be a brief distraction because he loved music more. So with his father's grudging blessing, Mike jacked it in to play with a band called Moonshine. He then gigged and did summer seasons for seven years. Then, by chance, he saw something in a shop window that fired his imagination. I remember walking past a travel agent's in the window, there was a big poster or a big cardboard display. And on it was the Canberra and the Oriana, the old Oriana, passing each other in Sydney Harbour. So the Opera House and the bridge and these two beautiful old ships. And um, in the bottom, there was, a, there was a picture of a singer with a microphone holding a lead, you know, looking quite ridiculous, you know. And I went, wow, so they have entertainment on these things, do they? So, you know, so I go in, get the brochure, and I write a letter to the address that's on the back. Of course, it's the wrong address, because that's the, uh, how to book a holiday. But they were very kind and sent me an address and where to write to. Mike's interview went well. Within a week, there's a phone call, and um, I get told that, that I've got the job, and I'm to fly to Sydney, Australia, to join the Oriana as an entertainment officer. And, you know, I've never flown before. Remember Dad, Mum and Dad take me up to Heathrow, Terminal 3, oh, in 1982. And I board this plane bound for Sydney. I, and my dad said, well, make sure you dress smartly for the plane now, you know, because and don't have, have a gin and tonic, he said to me. Don't have a beer now and all that. And I'm doing everything he said, you know. And I had this really tight shirt on with Keynote written in the back, which was a Little Woods brand, I think. And there I am with this, like this, and a, and a bar, a little bar that went through the collars, and you had to tighten up the bar, and I had this tie on, and I got this blazer on, and these trousers on, and these, oh, and they're like this, you know. And I get on the plane, and everyone's in, in then shell suits, if you remember. <laughs> and so Mike's love affair with cruise ships began. A love that has been passed on to his eldest son, Tom, who works as a technical engineer for a cruise liner company. I had to do everything from playing part in production shows to organizing deck games, organizing captains' cocktail parties, doing disembarkation, saying, just simply saying goodbye and shaking hands with 2,000 people. And again, later on the day, with, with people coming on, you know, it, it was, it just taught me an awful lot about myself. Today, Mike is a huge star aboard ship and can spend 10 months a year traveling the world, entertaining the passengers. But there are sacrifices, and none more so than ones felt by Mike's wife, Marie, 
and youngest son, Sam, at home in Bridgend. It really is tough. That is a good question. Um, I can't wait to come home all the time, you know. Marie gets the text from me saying, I just can't wait to get home. Uh, but the work is fantastic. I'm playing some of the finest theatres in the world. Some of the theatres hold 1,700 people and they're beautifully clean and the technology is fantastic. So the job, I love my job. Hashtag I love my job. It's, it's a great environment. It's where variety is now. Where once upon a time it was um, on the piers and in Blackpool and everywhere else, where it still is at, at some point, but it was very big then. But where it is very big now is on cruise ships and some of the biggest names in show business are now on cruise ships. Join us in part two to find out how a TV talent show launched Mike into the limelight. <laughs>
the world go round. There ain't nothing in the world like a big eyed girl to make me act so funny. Spend my money if you really loose like a long neck goose. Oh, baby, that's what I like, yeah. Grease was was candy rock and roll, make believe, but Buddy was the real deal, the real thing, you know. And he um, kind of felt it and looked at it like it, but this was just, it was great. You are, don't get me wrong, I, I played Vince Fontaine and the Teen Angel. So my song was, a beauty school dropout, no graduation day for you. So um, I was in that um, with Shane Ritchie and um, Lisa Maxwell played um, Marty opposite me as Vince Fontaine, and um, I had the time of my life in that. I did two years, two years of Rama Lama Ding Dong. Who put the bop in the bop shibop bop bop Who put the bop in the bop shibop shibop bop Who put the ram in the Rama Lama Ding Dong? For two years. And my wife will tell you, I can't watch Grease anymore. HTV Wales also wanted a slice of Mike, and he starred in a number of big shows. You can reach me by railway. You can reach me by trailway. You can reach me in an airplane. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mike Doyle. Good old HTV, my goodness. Ah, oh, the good old days. The good old days down at Culverhouse Cross. Oh, fantastic facility, you know. And it was, um, you know, the, their number one studio. was big space and, you know, I did all sorts of stuff in there. And um, they, they gave me uh, my own series. I think it was about 1990, I think. Can't remember, a long time ago. And we had some fantastic guests on there. You know, Shaking Stevens, he came on again. And um, we had... Danny Minogue. Yeah, Danny Minogue. More heavyweight acting roles then followed, with Mike playing legendary Welsh boxer Tommy Farr in a play written by Mal Pope called The Contender. It was a hard, gritty role that required him to learn to box. It's been a long road with a prize in sight, and I'm not going down without a fight. Mike has always loved mimicry and his versatile voice has also led to his own local radio show and voiceover work. If you put a roulette across North Wales, and it starts over in Carnarvon, yeah, yeah, brilliant, yeah, no, yeah, no. And you keep going, like, east, yeah, it's great, you get to Holwyn Bay, yeah, then they put a little bit of air yeah, at the end of it, yeah, oh, brilliant, yeah. And keep going east, and before you know it, you're in Flint, and then it's like a bit more like that, and before you know it, like you're in Queen's Ferry, then all of a sudden they start talking like that, so I know what's going on there, yeah. But perhaps his most recognisable voices are the ones used by a well-known car company advert. We've done about 17 to maybe 20 different voices for that. We've got Anne Harrod then, from West Wales then. Want to buy a car then? Talk to Gab then? Get higher and higher then? Oh, yes. And uh, her husband, Anne Harrod, man. Calm down, man. You sound like a Dalek. And we've got, um, we've got Stacey then from Mercer. Want to slang your face? Come and see Stace. Very good guy, Trevor. Who's, um, who's brilliant. And when Mike is not at sea on the cruise ships or performing one of his shows, he's in panto. He's done 23 and played everything from buttons to a dame. Pantomime is where I can be somebody else. And if you forget about everything. You be, it's acting again. It is acting. When some people say, oh, it's only panto, you know. Uh -uh, it doesn't work like that. You know, take this as serious as you would a Shakespeare play. And I know my few actors out there now laughing at that, but it's true. And those of them who really know it, they, they, they know that's true. It's a hectic life. But when there is some downtime, Mike likes to hit a few golf balls at the golf range near his home outside Bridgend. It can be frustrating at times if he hasn't put the practice in. Photography is also a huge passion, and with beaches like this on his doorstep, it's easy to see why. Mike also has the advantage of travelling all over the world on the cruise ships and documents the amazing places he has visited, something he didn't used to do when he was younger. 
I love my, my photography. I'll be honest, many, many years ago, I, we, the ship would pull into any port top of my head, Chiva de Vecchia, the, uh, the port for Rome. I didn't even go to Rome. I didn't bother get, doing a three-hour trip into Rome. No. I'd either not bother getting off the ship, or I'd go into Chiva de Vecchia and drink beer all day. But I'm older now and wiser. I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And uh, it's time to grow up. And the camera has certainly done that for me. I love, I love my photography. I've always been happy and grateful for what I've done or what I'm doing at the time, actually. I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing at the time. Sometimes I'll, I sit back and think, oh, gosh, I was nearly there. I was so nearly there so many times, you know. And, um, but I have done a lot of great things, and I'm very grateful for that. And, um, you know, some people could only dream of half of the things I've done. And so I feel really, really lucky. I'm very grateful for that. Um, when I look back, I'm, I wouldn't have had it any other way, really. I think Carmarthen, great town still is. Um, some great mates that I started off with, you know, to fuel the dream. And, um, and to this day, I still say I'm lucky to be in the work that I'm in. And I still have dreams. I still want to try and get to where I want to be. I met some great people, learned a lot from a lot of people, and um, there's no business like show business.